Welcome to episode 35 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this is the discussion episode of Hearing the Voice of the Unheard. In the regular episode, I, uh, in this episode, I invite Josh Fields as a co-host from the Libertarian Apothecary, and we have a discussion of the weekly episode. It has all the same content as the previous one, which was episode 34, but it is in a discussion style for those who enjoy that format more. And before I introduce Josh and let him tell you a little bit about himself, let me say I have an additional guest in the studio today, and that would be my son, who you probably have already heard playing with his toys. So please do not mind Liberty Dad having Liberty Son in the studio. <laughs> Josh, welcome to the show. How are you? Tell us about yourself a little bit. Oh, buddy, I'm, I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, I know we've been talking about this for a while, so I'm excited that we're, we're getting started with it. Um, as DL said, my name is uh, Josh Fields. I am uh, I do a show called the Libertarian Apothecary. It's a Facebook page now, but uh, we're transitioning over to free speech media, which pretty excited about that. Um, my show is a, a lot a lot of monologue. Uh, I go over uh, political topics. Um, I cover a lot of uh, literature, uh, those types of things. I like like foundational type knowledge, um, you know. And we're trying to see where that goes uh, from there. So, um, right now it's uh, about one show a week I do, but um, I'm very opinionated, and uh, obviously I'm a libertarian. Um, I think that kind of goes with it, you know. If you're opinionated or libertarian, you're definitely opinionated. Um, the second part, apothecary. I am a pharmacist, so I do approach uh, subjects and things naturally with a lot of objectivity and uh, it wasn't really until the past uh, probably seven years eight years that i started looking at politics the same way that i looked at uh, chemistry and um, oddly enough that coupled with a lot of other reading it kind of brought me into libertarianism and helped me discover the uh, concept of consent that i didn't really fully understand most of my adult life and um, so now I like to get behind a microphone and talk about it and find like minds that like to talk about such things. And uh, that's how I came across UDL. And now here I am on your show and uh, looking forward to a good conversation. Awesome. So I'm going to be periodically muting myself when we have, we have something else playing just to kind of make it a little bit easier for anybody watching to pay attention to the topic at hand and not Liberty's son over here because uh, he's being a bit noisy right now so that's pretty awesome but uh could be slightly distracting but no big deal uh, let, let me add this see that that's the other thing that you know uh, you and i've got in common you know we're both fathers we both have uh you know small children and uh so <laughs> i gotta make sure my mute button works too because you never know what's gonna happen so you know right. people just gonna have to bear with us it's what it is absolutely you know, we're, just, we're just common people yeah, and it's a it's a discussion style, right? We're here to be a little bit more casual. Um, yeah. Now, if just for anybody that's new that's listening, yeah. Liberty Dad is a family friendly show. Now, uh, I did get a a slightly humorous, maybe kind of fun poke the other night on my regular episode because I had a drink in it, and they said, "Hey, wait a minute, this is a family friendly show." And I said, "Yes, this is family friendly brandy here." So. Um, and it is a drink. We're not going to get sloshed or anything crazy here. So, let's get on with the show. Everyone, when the protests and the riots broke out last year, I observed that people were just like talking past each other, you know, and there seemed to be a whole lot going on with this whole Black Lives Matter and you know, All Lives Matter issue. And, you know, I felt like, you know, as I was listening, I was just like, man, this is, you know, these are two different phrases, but it's really more than that. And uh, it's more than just, you know, some terms or some phrases. It could be all lives matter, black lives matter. It could be people saying, you know, uh, something like they should have followed orders or somebody else saying, hey, you know, you need to consider your white privilege. You know, and, and we argue about systemic racism, but what we don't talk about is systemic lack of listening. And so, you know, I got thinking about it and I said, you know, to address the black lives matter, all lives matter issue, we need to go beyond those terms and maybe even ignore them altogether, at least at first, because the root of the divide goes deeper. 
And that's what the show is all about. It's all about leading to a different kind of conversation, breaking down those barriers, and challenging ourselves to do better, be better. And Josh is on the show to help me to be better. And Josh, definitely just jump right in anytime if there's, you know, you've got something oh, to say. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, you, you got to hold each other accountable. We like say, if we don't create standards of how we act, you know, so you keep me in line, I keep you in line. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, you know, I like to talk about on the show rhetoric a lot. I like to talk about social engineering. I like to talk about the words that we choose to use and what kind of power we give those words. And oftentimes many disagreements or conflicts that I come across with myself, uh, it usually starts with some misunderstanding about a definition that you're, you're using uh, with each other. So you talk past each other and um, you couple that with, as you said, we have an issue with not listening. Uh, we're all guilty of that at times. Um, but when you do get someone's attention, if you're using a word uh, or, a, or a slogan or, a sl you know, all lives matter, black lives matter, um, people subscribe, they, they, they put a meaning to that. And, and it may or may not be actually true to reality. And, um, and even people that are part of the movement, when they say black lives matter, you don't know exactly what that means to that individual. Uh, what you know is what you perceive from your vantage point. And that's why when we're talking about such delicate issues, it's important to understand what it is someone's feeling. Now, it doesn't mean what, they're, uh, what anybody is demanding is just. It just means you need to understand what their initial issue is. Uh, and Because most people, I think, um, if you boil it down, we're not too fundamentally different, but we, we really got to listen to each other. Absolutely. And now I will say we, we're, we're on a podcast and there is a certain level of telling that uh, comes with the territory when you're producing a podcast. But what we want to do is we want to demonstrate the, you know, we want to take this opportunity to demonstrate how one might listen first. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to really, really work hard to refrain from telling anybody what they should believe. What we're going to do is we're going to listen to some clips of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, his speech, The Other America. Uh, it's a really great speech. It's only about 45 minutes. However, for the show to kind of keep things a little bit more concise and to the point and, and you know, so it doesn't drag on too long, we are just going to use about an 11 minute segment of it. And I've got it cut into several different parts. And what we're going to do is we're going to listen to different segments. And then we're just going to talk about what did we hear out of this, you know, and then, um, then we'll continue on. Now, I will say there are a couple points where I had to do some research because his speech was uh, this speech was given in 1967, and because of that, he was talking about things that happened relatively recent to that year. Um, so these, these are things that I wasn't necessarily familiar with or not familiar enough with. So in those areas, I'll kind of give a little bit of background. But outside of that, we're just going to talk about what we heard. Maybe we were right. Maybe we're wrong, right? But this episode, that's what, that's, that's what we're getting into. Um, anything you got to say there, Josh, before I play this clip? You, you know, one thing for you, you listen to, we go back to the power of words. It, he was such a, a dynamic speaker because of the cadence that he used. Uh, you know, he really emphasized the words that he, you know, he used. They, they, they serve meaning. A lot of politicians or public speakers now, they, they'll say a lot of words, but say very little. Right. Uh, Dr. King was certainly not one of those, those people. So you, you need to, every word he said had meaning to what he was trying to convey. Uh, so I always try to remember that every time I hear him speak. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing these clips. Awesome. Well, let's get into it. Now, the other thing that we've got to come to see now that many of us didn't see too well during the last 10 years, and that is that racism is still alive in American society and much more widespread than we realize. We must see racism for what it is. It is a myth of the superior and the inferior race. It is the false and tragic notion that one particular group, one particular race is responsible for all of the progress, all of the insights and the total flow of history. And the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved innately impure and innately inferior. So Josh, 
first thoughts? <clears throat> you know, it, you can feel what he's saying. Um, you know, he, the one aspect about it, you know, and, and not that you have to be religious, um, you know, in this, and obviously Dr. King was, but, you know, he really emphasizes the human race. Uh, you know, that we, there, there are certain things that uh, we are not above each other when he talks about, you know, innately having these superiority type things. He, he wasn't, he was asking for equality, even though he didn't even use those words. Right. Uh, you, you can hear it and uh, you, you can, you can hear, feel the pain. Honestly, uh, you can tell what that man was saying he believed. And um, like you said, you got to put it in context at a time. You have to understand where those words are coming from. And obviously at that point in time in our history, uh, racism was very legal and advocated out loud. I mean, you know, and he talks about the, how it's deeper than most people realize. Well, you and I could sit here and talk about that. I mean, obviously what's been permitted through police behavior over the years from, you know, Rodney King made a kind of a turn on that, but like how segregation, I mean, it's just, it was terrible. The history is terrible, but it does go deeper than that. Cause that's just what we see. You know, you look at the history of occupational licensing, you want to talk about real systemic racism, right? Uh, these things have held down, you know, disenfranchised communities. And oftentimes, statistically, those are blacks, you know, so as we move here in the 21st century, those things still linger. And um, there's a lot of people that still have not actually heard what Dr. King was saying. Right. You know, I think what um, I think what really stands out to me is the, the very first thing I hear is that he gives us this very concise and very specific definition of racism. And it's something that's kind of bothered me over many years because you, you hear people use the term and, and I feel like people aren't really using the term uh, quite so consistently, right? And, and I think partially because they have a broader definition. You know, and, and his, his definition was basically like, look, if there's a claim of superiority or inferiority on the basis of race, um, and then that's, you know, th those claims, you know, are often said to be evident of the progress or behavior uh, or evident in the progress or the behavior of a people. And, uh, you know, I think that was, I think that was very interesting. He just nails it and says, look, look, if you have this view of inferiority or superiority, right, like that's, that's, that's racism. Yeah. You know, Jumping back, I almost said circle back, but then I had to remember that, you know, that new spokesperson for uh, for Biden likes to use that too much. Right. Um, circle, circle back to the power of words, just like I was saying before, racism. What does racism mean to you? Now, I, I have learned and have tried to educate myself over the years. What racism is to me as a Caucasian male who grew up in southern Ohio uh, and, and Appalachia, we did not have a very diverse population. So racism to me growing up uh, was definitely going to mean something different to me as opposed to someone who grew up in Detroit or who grew up in a different geographic area. So to me, I think it's important um, for people to understand instead of racism, set that word aside, like you had mentioned earlier, what do you mean by that? What right. is racism to you? What is it you're, you're looking for? I've, I've heard people say, you know, racist, like, like I, I agree completely. If you, if you view yourself as being superior or inferior, whatever, which way, uh, or something judged based upon a, you know, a genetic representation, which is all skin color is it's like eyes, you know, hair, you know, and obviously there's the cultural aspect of it too. But when you talk about these people who want to say, one race, one race is superior to the other. They're talking about genetics, right? Th that's, that's what they're talking about when you boil everything away. And, um, you know, we are all human beings and we need to get back to, I don't know. Yeah. I, no, I hear you. I, I, I totally understand. And Sorry. I think Munchkin. <laughs> Munchkin. Oh, you're good. You're good. He's waving at me. It's like, so it's all good. So I don't even know what I was saying. This, this is the Liberty dad show. So, you know, there's going to be kids on it from time to time and they're going to be like, Hey, pop in their head in the screen and be like, "Hey, Dad, can I have a cookie?" You're like, yes, yes, sure, cookie. Right All right, so I, I got. Don't it. tell so, your mother. So we got to Yeah, don't tell your mom. Um, we got to make sure we're talking the same language. If we're going to Absolutely. ever solve racism, or at least come to peace with that, we're going to be different, and some people need to just be over there and some over here. Which I'm not advocating for that. We at least need to have a definition that we're commonly used that we can right. communicate with one another. Yep. So, you know, we can get past these, these bridges. 
Absolutely. You know what? Let's let's listen to that next clip and see where it takes us, because I think we've got some. Yeah, I think we've got some good stuff here that we're going to be listening in on. In the final analysis, racism is evil because this, its ultimate logic is genocide. Hitler was a sick and tragic man who carried racism to its logical conclusion. And he ended up leading a nation to the point of killing about six million Jews. And this is the tragedy of racism because its ultimate logic is genocide. If one says that I am not good enough to live next door to him, if one says that I am not good enough to eat at a lunch counter or to have a good, decent job or to go to school with him merely because of my race, he is saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. To use a philosophical analogy here, racism is not based on some empirical generalization. It is based rather on an ontological affirmation. It is not the assertion that certain people are behind culturally or otherwise because of environmental conditions. It is the affirmation that the very being of a people is inferior. And this is the great tragedy of it. I say that however unpleasant it is, we must honestly see and admit that racism is still deeply rooted all over America, it's still deeply rooted in the North, and it's still deeply rooted in the South. Any initial thoughts there, Josh? All right, looks like Josh is a little bit tied up here. So I will go ahead and kick in the oh, prior no, segment. Actually, oh, I thought I was talking. I had oh, gotcha. Son. Gotcha. I, I didn't uh, see it. I thought maybe uh, you were talking to your child. I was like, oh, oh no, okay. no, I was trying to talk to everybody. Um, see, I, I'm an I'm an amateur. It's uh, all good. It's all good. Yeah. It's an amateur show. So you're yeah, in good company. So, uh, no, you know, he's he, he's absolutely right. Ra racism is evil, especially when it is taken to its logical conclusion of genocide. Obviously, whenever uh, he mentioned Hitler. I mean, it's just that can lead to tragic ends and, and absolutely and it always does throughout history. Um, it's an important note, something I, I would I'd like to bring up the, the shift in racism. Uh, it, it, this is my opinion, you know, and this is just deducted from things that I've read. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever we became a, a free free nation, there was quite a number of people who were abolitionist at the time. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that even Jefferson had in the uh, original declaration, uh, he was calling out slavery as basically being an abomination. It was evils that the king had, was doing to the population. And, and granted, I understand the hypocrisy. He had slaves. Everybody right. knows the story. But, you know, we, we oversimplify history way too often. And when we do that, we, we truly lack the, the understanding to how to navigate those type of complex situations because we, we only pick one, one or two aspects out of it. Right. I mean, the elimination of slavery, you know, was a long process. Uh, people didn't just go all of a sudden from being OK with it or not OK with it to being OK with it. Mm -hmm. And there were many layers to that. And, um, you know, when it relates to, to this, especially when you look at it from a, a either a Christian perspective or with what I like, a natural law and natural rights and self-ownership perspective, people had to find a way to morally justify themselves, justify why slavery was okay. Mm -hmm. So why is it okay if I have self-ownership as a Christian or, um, you know, a believer in natural rights uh, to, to condemn this other person as less than human? Well, to me, that was one of the original big lies. Uh, they start having this deviation that somehow, even though we're all humans, we are all different animals, that we're different species. And, and so instead of looking at uh, an African excuse me, an African at the time, African-American, now a black person, uh, they would look at them as though, oh, yeah, you can go to school and you can do all the, the, these types of things and learn, but, but you're handicapped because you're not quite fully human. So they presented this type of thought, and that's what led all the way through, uh, you know, the Civil War and Jim Crow, and because a lot of these groups, they became brainwashed over time to believe that this color skin, they are not exactly human, and it literally has taken over a hundred years to, to push that down and to destroy that and to make that scientifically inaccurate. 
but here we are, those myths and those, those concepts lie buried deep in some cultural crevices of this country still. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I think it's interesting that not only does Dr. King clarify and say, look, this is what racism is. He says what it isn't, um, at least in one context. So you get this idea of, okay, here's the boundary. And I think that's really, really important in this conversation because the issue of racism has been in this country for so long and in so many different facets. Yeah. But I, so I think at some point it becomes a little bit muddied where you've got some people who say, look, you know, this has been my experience and their experience leads them to to have this perspective that somebody else's experience wouldn't. So for instance, uh, you know, I, I've experienced a little bit of racism because growing up, I was not always, I, well, I was almost never considered white, if you will. Uh, most of my friends would jokingly ask me and say, you know, okay, but seriously, what are you? I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I wouldn't have to work. I mean, it was just crazy. I heard, it. but in most cases, it was it was genuine. You know, just people were curious. You know, and nobody was yeah. really trying to um, trying to harm me. Um, and then the little bit of racism that I did experience was pretty low key comparative to probably anything, right? Like it's probably the least amount of racism that you could uh, that you could come across. But somebody else's experience you know, might have had a lot of racism that they've had to deal with, you know, whether it be through the police or through yeah. people at school, through their neighbors, people at work, you know, what have you, wherever, wherever it, they found it, wherever it, it, it found them, I guess is probably a better way to say it. You know, yeah. so I think it's really good to kind of, you know, if we're going to have a conversation, if we're going to understand people, the first thing we need to do is listen, but then we also have to kind of like say, okay, here's what this thing is. And here's what it isn't so that people can kind of understand and say, like, I, I, you know, we're on the same page, you know, and I think that's, I think that's kind of the, um, the takeaway here, uh, you know, in, in that we can't talk about, how do we talk about people as a group if we haven't established how we can talk about people in a group, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you start with the belief that somebody is just naturally inferior or they're superior, um, you know, that's, that's, that itself is, you know, pretty foul. Um, yeah. And then if it's even further foul, if you use that as, um, if you use their progress or the lack thereof, um, and, and then presume that you're talking about evidence when, in fact, you're really not. Yeah, you, you know, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's like it, you're using they're, they're inside of a system. And by they, you know, it, it's, it's all minorities. And, in, and I'm also going to include people who are uh, indigent, you know, poor, you know, that they end up in the category like, well, they're, they're not succeeding because they're not capable of doing it or some other, some other excuse. And they use that as evidence when really it's, they're trapped in a cycle. Right. And, and um, you know, but the thing is like, I, this is my opinion, the, the, the blatant, racism and i'm defining that as malicious like i want to go out of my way and i want to hurt you because of xyz that blatant racism i i believe from my perspective that has declined over the years sure uh, you know right but the thing is whenever we keep shifting uh the definition of what racism is you've opened that up to now it's not only the malicious is it just a passive a comedian saying a joke on tv Right. You know, do, do we measure the intent or or the maliciousness of a word, uh, especially too when we have double and triple standards as to who can say what uh, it, it confuses the conversation as to what are we actually trying to achieve? Right. So let's focus. So let's let's try to keep focusing on Dr. King and what he's saying and what we're hearing from him. Uh, you know, don't worry. Plenty of episodes later, we are going to be talking about some of our own opinions. But for right now, what I want to do is I want to just make sure that we're really focusing on, you know, what is what did Dr. King say? What did I hear? You know, because what we're doing is we're, you know, it's it's a little harder in a discussion style on a podcast episode, right? Because you're naturally inclined to say, okay, well, let me tell you about this opinion here. Uh, but what we want to try to do is we want to, you know, for you listening, for you or for you people, uh, for for those that are watching, for you people, oh boy, um, for those that are watching, I want you to really get the idea of listening, 
it's easier, you know, when a friend comes over and I want to listen to them. It's a little harder when I'm in a discussion with somebody, you know, because I'm you're naturally inclined, you know, I mean, like I've got my little script here. I'm not going to lie. I've got my script here. and It's helping me keep focus on it. Um, if I didn't have the script, it would be really hard because I would be naturally inclined, uh, you know, like anybody would. But it's something that we've got to practice. We've got to do. And I don't mean just, you know, Josh and I, I mean, everybody, we, if you're watching, that's you. We have to listen to everybody. So let's go ahead and continue on. Let's hear what, uh, let's hear the next clip from Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King in his speech, The Other America. And uh, let's see where it takes us. Now this leads me to say something about another discussion that we hear a great deal. And that is the so-called white backlash. I would like to honestly say to you that the white backlash is merely a new name for an old phenomenon. It's not something that just came into being because shouts of shouts of black power or because Negroes engaged in riots in Watts, for instance. The fact is that the state of California voted a fair housing bill out of existence before anybody shouted black power before anybody rioted in Watts. It may well be that shouts of black power and riots in Watts and the Hollams and the other areas are the consequences of the white backlash rather than the cause of them. What it is necessary to see is that there has never been a single solid monistic determined commitment on the part of the vast majority of white Americans the whole question of civil rights and on the whole question of racial equality. This is something that truth impels all men of goodwill to admit. So, <laughs> excuse me, in this section, let me start by saying that there are a few events here that I was less familiar with and I had to do a little research. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about them and then we'll, you know, we'll talk about what we heard from Dr. King. Uh, but I think it's I think it makes it a little bit easier if you at least understand, you know, a little bit of history of what's going on here. In those three things, he was talking about the fair housing bill, the Watts riots, and then this phrase, black power. So let's start with the fair housing bill. I believe that's the Rumford Fair Housing Act of 1963. And what it was supposed to do is prevent landlords and property owners from refusing to rent to members of the black community. And then about a year later, California passed this Proposition 14. And what that did was it nullified the Rumford Fair Housing Act. Okay, so you have this, that, so that's what we've got going on here. We've got this, uh, this Fair Housing Act that proceeded to prevent people from being discriminated against. And then you get this nullification uh, a year later. And that's what, uh, that's what Dr. King is talking about. Then you have the Watts riots. The Watts riots were six days and it was, you know, some serious unrest and kind of putting it lightly. It resulted in 34 deaths and about $40 million worth of property damage. The uh, watch riots, they, they were about a five-day uh, event that occurred between August 11th and August 16th in 1965. And, you know, it was initiated by a, uh, Josh, you're going to have to take over. I've got a little dilemma. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> well, to add to that, uh, yeah, he, he was covering the, um, the different things that had gone on, and he had said mentioned about white backlash that there was already some some actions that preceded these events um, that had caused unrest and um, you know some disharmony in in the black communities. Whenever they were allowed to to be discriminated against through housing. Um, it just created this this cycle that just um, got it squared away. You good? I think so. I think so. Just uh, I don't want to describe what just happened here, but let's Wait. just say I got a two year old boy, and he's doing what a two year old boy does, creating a little bit of pandemonium here. Oh, yeah. So let's see. So we were talking about the, so I, was, I was kind of like finishing up on the Watts riots and I was talking about, yeah. hey, it, it occurred between August 11th and August 16th, 1965. Mm -hmm. And it was initiated by a minor roadside or by a roadside altercation between uh, police and a black family. 
And then you finally you had activist Stokely Carmichael who popularized the term black power on June 16th in 1966. And when this came out of a speech that was in response to the shooting of James Meredith by a white man. And this happened on the second day of a 220 mile march called March Against Fear. And that occurred between Memphis, Tennessee and Jackson, Mississippi. And the plan had originally been to, for Stokely to come out and they were going to use this term, right? They were going to get this, you know, use this to get the crowd going. Then Stokely gets arrested. Okay. And uh, his peers were like, you know what? Don't worry about it. We've got this under control. And so what they said is, you know, we'll get you out and then we're going to have the crowd ready. And you use that as kind of like a jumping off point. You, you know, you, you add this to, to the fire, you know, and this is what he said, at least this is the, the portion of what he said. He, he said, this is the 27th time that I have been arrested. I ain't going to jail no more. And the only way we're going to stop them white men from whooping us is to take over. And we're gonna, what we're going to start saying now is black power. Now, what's interesting about that phrase is uh, there's some interviews that you can find on YouTube. And they're talking to Stokely years later. And he was not really expecting the crowd to give him the response that he got. And some other people... They had chimed in. I don't know who the other gentlemen were, but some other men had said, you know, this phrase black power, it, um, people had trouble disassociating that from the idea of violence. Yeah. And so that was one of the reasons why black power seemed so tremendously negative was because it was like, oh my God, they're going to do some violent takeover. And, you know, it appears from listening to some of these interviews that wasn't actually the case. So that's the that's the relevant portion that was part of Dr. King's uh, D Dr. King's speech. And, uh, you know, when he talks about like the riots and phrases like black power and this white backlash. So, Josh, I think you were in the middle of something when I had, when well, I had to rush back. Well, what I was saying is like I, I didn't I didn't expand. I'm glad you, you finished talking about some of what led up to uh, th these events. But I had started talking about the white backlash, you know, it, conceptually with what uh, King was trying to say. Uh, Things preceded these events. You know, like you said, the gentleman had been arrested 27 times and he's like, I'm done. I've had enough. Right. You know, where is where is this equal justice in the eyes of the law? Where, right. where, is, where is this going? And, you know, and right after that, you mentioned, you know, about the black power. I mean, in reality, if you actually look down to it and you look, what did they mean by this? Well, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody of any race would, would disagree with that power right. to the individual, you know, sovereignty recognize, you know, but it was hijacked. And we know that that change in the narrative was helped and facilitated by our CIA. Right. And the, and the FBI. Um, but so, but you see that all the time, you'll have an altruistic movement that'll happen that, that wants to facilitate some sort of real change and it gets hijacked. And like King was saying, this stuff didn't just happen. You know, you can't, there's things that preceded this and that's the white backlash that, that we're getting because right. systemic racism is real. It's there. And until I think what was the last line in that it was brilliant. Uh, maybe it was a clip before that. Um, the, the goodwill of men that we, we, we compelled to recognize this truth. We we're compelled right. to recognize it. It's true. It's, it's right there in front of us. And uh, you know, so it's just. Absolutely. It's and, and yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think what, I think what Dr. King is trying to tell us is like, look, White people have a, you know, and, and, and I don't think he says it in a negative way. I think he's just like, no. look, you have, you've had a different experience. Your experience leads you to believe that this is the chronology of events. And what he's saying is, I think that you've missed a few things when you've considered um, your position. And when you start putting things into perspective, you realize that the chronology of events is a little bit different, which would put the white backlash as as uh, coming, um, oh, drawing a blank, blank on my words here, I'm distracted by my son, but that's okay. But he's, he's basically saying that the white backlash is not a cause of black uh, um, um, activity within the black community, whether they be riots or whether they be black power or what have you, uh, phrases like black power, but what they are is they're a driver for those. And yeah. so that's that's what I hear him saying is like, look, you've got this backwards. You really need to like really think about this a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Now, to get a little bit better picture, we're going to need to continue listening and hear what he says next. It is said on the Statue of Liberty that America 
is the home of exiles. But it doesn't take us long to realize that America has been the home of its white exiles from Europe. But it has not evinced the same kind of maternal care and concern for its black exiles from Africa. And it is no wonder that in one of his sorrow songs, the Negro could sing out, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. What great estrangement, what great sense of rejection caused the people to emerge with such a metaphor as they looked over their lives. What I'm trying to get across is that our nation has constantly taken a positive step forward on the question of racial justice and racial equality. But over and over again at the same time, it made certain backward steps. And this has been the persistence of the so-called white backlash. In 1863, the Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery. But at the same time, the nation refused to give him land to make that freedom meaningful. And at that same period, America was giving millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that America was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor that would make it possible to grow and develop. And we refused to give that economic floor to its black peasants, so to speak. And this is why Frederick Douglass could say that emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger, freedom to the winds and rains of heaven, freedom without roofs to cover their heads. He went on to say that it was freedom without bread to eat, freedom without land to cultivate. It was freedom and famine at the same time, but it does not stop there. So now we, we we hear a little bit more about this this white backlash. And, you know, first, you know, we, we got to dive into a little bit of history here. You know, again, remember, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Lincoln September 22nd, 1862. And what that did is it changed the legal status of almost four million people from slave to free. So we basically went from, uh, you might just say, black people to black Americans. OK, so this is a fabulous piece of legislation, as far as I can tell. Right. Like this isn't one that I would have actually disagreed with, uh, not by any stretch. And then um, but then you have this thing, uh, the Homestead Acts, and they had been signed by President Lincoln. And these were supposed to offer a method of home ownership to Americans from uh, of land that was not already privately owned. So they're basically going to take like either land that was just unowned or land that was federally owned. And then they were going to offer Americans this opportunity to own it, including black Americans. And then you have like the Southern Homestead Act of 1866 that was passed again to compensate for the failures of 40 acres and a mule, which everybody's familiar with, you know? And so what, this is the basis for what Fred, Frederick Douglass, who Dr. King um, uh, cites in his in, in his speech, and you know, and he's saying like, look, uh, you know, the, the, the Douglass and others were complaining about blacks being, you know, terrorized by various groups in the South, and you know, people said, hey, you've you, you've 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 done enough, and what Dr. King here is saying is like he's tapping on to this, at least what I'm hearing him say. Again, you know, I'm not speaking authoritatively here; I'm just telling you what yeah. I've heard. But what I hear him saying is this white backlash is partially an issue of taking a step forward and moving a step or two back. You know, we, we do this run for Fair Housing Act, but then we've got Proposition uh, 14. We, you know, we say 40 acres and a mule, but then that doesn't work out. So then we create something else and then that doesn't work out. Then we create another thing. And so we, we keep doing all these things to uh, to to assist in really materializing freedom mm -hmm. for these four million people, and then we keep undoing it through different actions. Uh, yeah, well, 
He's absolutely right. Two steps forward, you know, one step back every time. But, you know, from what he was saying and, you know, from how I felt about it is they, they were free. Like he said, he quoted Frederick Douglass and I'm paraphrasing, you know, we, we were now free for star, you know, freedom of starvation, freedom to starve, mm -hmm. basically, you know, they, they freed them from the plantation, but they never took the shackles off. That's what it comes right. down to. And, you know, that makes it very hard for any, for success was a much larger mountain and has been, you know, and slowly they've, they've slowly rearranged the shackles, taken a few off here and there. And, um, you know, but that's, that's what he's saying. You know, I mean, what is freedom? How we define freedom? Right. Absolutely. Now, I think it's worthwhile to hear the words of Frederick Douglass. And so I've got that. I've got that here as well. So we're going to go ahead and play that real quickly because he cites Frederick Douglass and he, he does cite, a, you know, a significant portion of this speech from Frederick Douglass. But I want to hear what you know, the, the, the fullness in, in the context, so we can, we can kind of get a better idea of what is, what is King trying to tell me? And one of the things that I need to do is go and understand what he understands to the best of my ability. So let's go ahead and play that real quick. It's said by some, we have done enough for the Negro. Yes, you have done a great deal for the Negro. And for one, I am deeply sensible of it and grateful for it. But after all, what have you done? We were slaves, and you made us free, and given us the ballot. But the world has never seen any people turned loose to such destitution as were the four million slaves in the South. The old roof was pulled down over their head before they could make themselves a shelter. They were free, free to hunger, free to the winds and rains of heaven, free to the pitiless wrath of enraged masters, who, since they could no longer control them, were willing to see them starve. They were free, without roofs to cover them, or bread to eat, or land to cultivate, and as a consequence, died in such numbers as to awaken the hope of their enemies that they should soon disappear. We gave them freedom and famine at the same time. The marvel is that they still live. What the Negro wants first is protection to the rights already conceded by law, and secondly, education. Talk of having done enough for these people, after 200 years of enforced ignorance and stripes, is absurd, cruel, and heartless. Today in the South, the schoolhouse is burned. Today in Tennessee, Lucy Hayden is called from her inner room at midnight and shot down because she teaches colored children to read. Today in New Orleans, and in Louisiana, and in parts of Alabama, the black man scarcely dares to deposit the votes which you gave him the right to deposit for fear of his life. We want your voices again. All right. So it's very interesting to hear that because he's talking about 200 years after the fact. And Dr. Martin Luther King is talking roughly about 100 years after that. So we've got like 300 years, I believe, if I got my timeline correct, right? And what's interesting, what I hear is Dr. King saying, some of the same situations, some of the things that are going on are no different from a hundred years ago than they are today. And they were happening 200 years removed post-slavery. And then a hundred years after that, they're still happening. We're still having some of these same problems, maybe in a different fashion, but they're ultimately very, very similar. Yeah. Fundamental problems still there. So I think that was, uh, you know, I think that really helps tie in what Dr. King is saying. And, you know, and they make some specific things. So I think that's really great that they, they talk about very specific things like saying, hey, you're free to vote, but then turning around and saying, oh, man, you got to pass this literacy test in order to vote, knowing full well that there was, you know, a, a lack of literacy on part of Black Americans. So it was very, very intentional, you know, no matter how they might try to play it off and say, oh, well, we just want to make sure this or that. No, no, no. You know what you were doing. You know that uh, that slaves were not able to read. They were not literate. And then when you freed them, they still were not slaves. They were, I mean, they still weren't uh, able to read and they still were not, you know, literate. And they had to catch up. And then you, every time that it was an opportunity to catch up, you, you got in their way, you stifled it, you know? And I think that's, I think didn't that's- let them, Didn't let them participate in society. They didn't have the same opportunities. 
Absolutely. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, occupational licensing was one of them, whether it's, whether it's voting or going to work, they, there was always this unreasonable standard that was set for them. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm trying to think of where I want to go with this, but uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm trying to collect my thoughts on this, but I, I kind of understand why there was frustration. When you start putting this all together, you, you, you understand why there's some. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I, the, the frustration level, I mean, I, anybody who questions the validity of the, of generations and generations worth of mistreatment, I mean, the frustration is very real and uh, it, you know, it, ha it has to be addressed some way or it's going to manifest itself in some way that might be negative. Like Dr. King was talking about, you know, you, they want to be heard. Uh, people want to be heard. Everybody wants to be heard. And that's that's part of why we're doing this. So we can learn how to hear and listen. Right. You know, and, you know, and it's challenging because you want to I think it's challenging even more today a little bit than it might have been in those days, because today I think a lot of people want to see themselves. And I'm, I'm just guessing here. You know, I, I have no idea for sure. But, uh, you know, I, I know that I like to feel like. I have worked really hard to not be racist. I don't know that people could say that honestly back in the 60s um, or any time prior th to that. I mean, maybe some people could, but I think largely a lot of people couldn't say that. And so, you know, I, I think there was a different, there was a different feeling for sure. But I think our feeling is, hey, I have not been racist, you know, um, uh, you know, but I think, when, you know, and, and, and I think it leads us to kind of dismiss somebody's experience. And I think that's where the problem is, is, you know, we're busy, again, focusing on us and not somebody else and saying, all right, let me just hear your experience, right? And, and sometimes when you hear somebody's experience, you might have to start asking some whys and say, okay, well, or, or what, you know, like, what, what do you mean? Or why? Or, you know, where, where, how did you get there? You know, and that's what I did here with this speech. I listened to it and I said, I don't know what that is. Let me go look it up. And then I would go look it up and I would read about it. And I was like, wow, okay, that really puts it into a different perspective. One that I didn't have before I went and searched it out. And again, this is how we should have conversations with people. When we, uh, when we're listening, we listen. And if we don't readily understand something, admit it and ask and say, look, leave me, leave me here. You know, tell me what, tell me what's going on here. So. Absolutely. It's, it's that's completely imperative to do that because, and you said, you think it's, it's gotten more difficult uh, to have those conversations. And, and I agree with you. And I'm not saying social engineering and, and those types of things weren't transpiring then they were, but now they're, they're taken to the umpteenth degree. So you have to pay even more mind to listen to mm -hmm. what you're, to what you're seeing, what you're hearing and uh, than you did before, because there is a war for our mind and that has to be addressed as being an obstacle to this. Right. You know, so not we everybody have... has altruistic intentions. Absolutely. And there are especially particularly if you happen to be a racist, hateful person, right. You know, you know, you're not necessarily going to come out with a big sign and saying, Hey, I'm racist. You know, instead you're going to be, you know, writing bills and getting them passed and absolutely. smiling for cameras. Yep. Absolutely. And if you're not a racist, then the thing that you have to make sure you're doing is listen. Speaking of listening, we got three more clips. So let's get through these clips and let's let's hear what he's got to tell us. Because you know, I think he's I think it's I think it's fascinating, honestly. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize. Um, you know, we always hear about the, the "I have a dream" speech, and we've heard that quite a bit. But you don't hear about his other speeches. And you know, and, and when I started listening to this one, I was like, "Wow, that's, you know, like how come I've never heard about this one? You know, like what happened? What, what did I miss along the way?" Uh, so now we're catching back up. So let's catch up on that. In 1875, the nation passed a civil rights bill and refused to enforce it. In 1964, the nation passed a weaker civil rights bill. And even to this day, that bill has not been totally enforced in all of its dimensions. The nation heralded a new day of concern for the poor, for the poverty-stricken, for the disadvantaged, and brought into being a poverty bill. But at the same time, it put such little money into the program that it was hardly and still remains hardly a good skirmish against poverty. White politicians in suburb, suburbs talk eloquently against open housing, 
and in the same breath contend that they are not racist. And all of this and all of these things tell us that America has been backlashing on the whole question of basic constitutional and God-given rights for Negroes and other disadvantaged groups for more than 300 years. So these conditions, persistence of widespread poverty, of slums, and of tragic conditions in schools and other areas of life, all of these things have brought about a great deal of despair and a great deal of desperation, a great deal of disappointment and even bitterness in the Negro communities. And today all of our cities confront huge problems. All of our cities are potentially powder kegs as a result of the continued existence of these conditions. Many in moments of anger, many in moments of deep bitterness, engage in riots. All right. So that was the next portion of it. And I think we're starting to get to some really, really interesting stuff here. And I think the first thing that I'm getting out of it is that he, um, you know, you know, and when he's talking about the things that black Americans have not seen materialize. He talks about the, uh, you know, the version of the first version of the 1964 bill, which wasn't enforced. And then he talked about the second one that wasn't enforced. And then now remember, he's giving this speech in 1967. So three years later and three years later, he's saying, look, you've passed two bills and you have failed to enforce either one of them at the appropriate level uh, or, you know, in the appropriate level would be the uh, in full. Right. And so that and so I think that's, that's that's pretty interesting, in my opinion, that that goes toward what he's saying in from what I'm hearing, which is step forward. We step back. We step forward again. We step back. You know, so why I mean, would you expect people to not be I mean, frustrated? The that this is the, to, the experience uh, that they're up, having. Stand up and give a speech in a civil manner uh, using the articulation that he does. Uh, at that point in time, I mean, I would be boiling over. I mean, you've done everything the way that uh, we ask in this society with government and bills get passed right. that are supposed to recognize us as constitutional rights having God given, you know, uh, and it's still not coming to fruition, even though it passed through the proper channels. And um, so the frustrations were obviously still there. And I just think it's a testament to what kind of leader he actually right. was because he wasn't. He didn't give up on peace yet. And that was the thing. I mean, he did not give up on it. And um, a lot of lesser people would have. I, I'm not even going to sit here and say, right. oh, I, I still would have been peaceful. I, you know, I don't know. If we put ourselves in that situation, like, okay, well, I did everything right. Here I am doing everything right. But yet you still have your boot on my neck. So right. at what point in time do, do we not think it reasonable that an animal backed into a corner is not going to lash out, no matter right. what it is? You know, so... I, I hear it, I, I, but I feel the frustration in his words. And right, and 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 that's and that's what we're trying to get at here, everyone. Is that when you listen and then you start really trying to understand, you can start maybe getting a sense of how this person that you're talking to or listening to is feeling, right? And imagine how you would feel if the group of people that you were a part of had been enslaved. And remember, we're, this is, let's, let's, let's lead up to where we are now in this particular speech, right? Where, where we're talking about. People were freed. A couple hundred years later, you have somebody like Frederick Douglass. He says, look, you know, we just, you know, we'd like some education and we'd like you to treat us equally under the law. I mean, that's what he's saying. It seems pretty simple to me. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, and then he's saying, but it's not happening. And everything you do, then you take a step back. And then Dr. King says, 100 years later, he says, okay, we're still doing that. Step forward, step back, you know. And then he says, hey, you know, and this is, this is where we're starting to get into some of the meat of things that people are more familiar with in general, you know, like the riots and whatnot. 
and this is what he says, it leads people to be frustrated and to engage um, in riots, right? And that's where we are in this particular point of his speech. And just imagine, like, if you were part of this group of people, if you're not, you know, wouldn't you feel a little bit frustrated? Now, again, we're not, I, I, I'm not saying that things like riots are okay. We're not making any judgment there. What we're all we're trying to do is just simply say, what is this man saying? What am I hearing? Let me put it into context so that I can understand. Right? That's, that, 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 that's all we're getting at at this point, right? We're not getting any further than that. So let's continue on real quick. We got, we got, some, we got a couple more pieces in here, and I think, he, I think it's getting to some juicy parts here. Let me say, as I've always said, and I will always continue to say, that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. I'm still convinced that non-violence is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and justice. I feel that violence will only create more social problems than they will solve, that in a real sense it is impractical for the Negro to even think of mounting a violent revolution in the United States. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way. Continue to affirm that there is another way. All right. So there's another way. Josh, what's that other way? Oh, we haven't got there yet. Don't. What did you hear? What did well, you hear, Josh? I kind of got ahead of myself in the last segment because I said, you know, he still stood with trying to look for peaceful measures. Uh, he, you know, I, on a, on a deep level, I agree with him that violence isn't the answer. And that'll be a topic for a whole other conversation. Cause I've got the stack why. Right. Um, but he had, uh, he knew that his, the people that were listening to him and listened to him, uh, if he would have advocated right. for violence at that point in time, uh, there would have been mass violence, um, you know, m most likely. He, he was in a position where he could um, give people hope without feeding into the fear. And I, I, I think that's a, a right. great lesson for all of us to, to focus on hope more than fear and try to use the fostering of conversations and, and those types of things over violence. And you know, it's just this powerful stuff. It just, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's very, he, he makes it very clear, you know, that he is opposed yeah. to riots. Uh, you know, and I, so the, the end of story, like I, this is what I hear from him. riots, yeah. not acceptable. And not only that, are they just not acceptable? He thinks they're no, counterproductive, yeah. which I do too, you know? Um, and, and he said that they make they things do. worse, right? And it would just, it, you know, and, and there should, and there, he will always uh, push for peaceful means of changing the culture and society. So let's continue on. Let's get to that. I think this is the final clip now. We're going to listen to this final clip and see what he has to say. But at the same time, it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society, which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, 
we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. All right. So justice is the preventer of, is a riot prevention. Uh, you know, I, again, I think this is probably the most par powerful portion of his speech, uh, in my opinion. And, you know, it's very interesting because this is where he says that extremely famous phrase, you know, a riot is the language of the unheard. And you hear that. I mean, I've heard it in songs. I've heard people uh, talk about it, you know, and, and but they don't talk about it in the same way that I hear Dr. King talk about Dr. King talk about it because he says, look, I'm opposed to riots. But I cannot in good conscience oppose the riots without opposing what causes those riots. And I think this is where listening really, really comes into play is by hearing him say, OK, let's take a, and set aside my disdain for the idea of riots. And then let's hear what it is that's causing people to go there. Right. Like this is and it's and I, and I don't think he's justifying it by any stretch of the imagination. I think what he's saying is like, look, the things that you could easily do to prevent riots, yeah. you're not doing. Right. And, and I think that's what I'm hearing him say. You know, he's talking about two sides of an unwanted coin. You've got the riots and then you've got the things that are that are leading it's, up to the riots. it's a hard thing for anybody to say like when you have two bad situations and unfortunately if you if you only mention one of them somebody thinks you advocate or support the other so to me what i heard him saying right. was like look i don't i don't con uh, condone these riots these the, these aren't the this isn't the path that i want to go but you must hear the reasons why these are transpiring you got you have to understand it like right. he said they don't just come from thin air you know, there, there's a reason until we, till we hear that reason, they're going to continue. And I didn't, I didn't take that as a threat either. I took him as a statement of fact, the man understood the situation and understood what it was. And uh, he, they both needed equally condemned. So. Absolutely. And, you know, I think what happens is when I listen to his words and then I dig in or, you know, when we like, let's just not leave it at me. We're, we're talking, we're talking about all of us. When we listen to Dr. King's words or anybody's words, and we dig in when we're not familiar, you know, that, then we can start hearing what they're trying to say. In this particular case, what I think he's trying to say is that, look, there are many promises that have went unfulfilled, even stifled. You know, what I hear him saying is that, you know, I, I don't hear a man speaking on behalf of an ungrateful community, but one that's been dealing with repeated broken promises, you know, and, and, and one that's telling me that the, to view the divide between white and Americans and black Americans a little differently from the, you know, constant, from, from the consideration of the other side's perspective, if we want to split ourselves into sides here for a moment. Right. And, you know, ultimately that what black Americans want is protection to the rights already conceded by the law, you know, and then, it, of course, education. Like, the, and um, imagine, think about it this way. Imagine the world that we would be in if the only two things that we did in the last 100 years was to ensure protection to the rights afforded to every person black or white, doesn't matter, as afforded by the law, and then simply just did education. Now, I know libertarians are not big on public education, but just imagine for a moment what that world would look like if this is the only two things that we did. We'd, I think it'd be an entirely there, different there's world. There's no doubt. I, you know, obviously, you and I can go on tangents about how different the world would be. Just our government structure would look completely different. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be right. truly a different world. And, and honestly, I, I think that's the world Dr. King was envisioning where those things, because uh, he did believe in the Constitution, he did believe in natural law, and natural rights. He was a fan of Thomas Aquinas. You know, you know, he believed mm -hmm. these things, and he wanted us all to be un underneath the law equally, as we are all already equal under the eyes of God. Right. All right, everyone. That's so, so that concludes this portion of the show. Now, did we get that all that right? Hey, maybe, maybe not, right? Dr. King is not here to tell me, hey, DL, 
you got some of that right or most of that right or even all of that right. He's not here to tell me that. But the point is that I am trying to listen. I'm trying to learn how to listen and then just recite back what I've heard because I believe that that will just take us bounds and bounds, miles and miles with each other if we do just that. And I, and I want to point out a quote that I like. It's don't listen with the intent of answering, but with the intent of understanding. And I think it's a very valuable quote because without truly understanding, at best, we can't offer our best. And at worst, we probably have nothing to offer. So that's this portion of the show. I hope everybody enjoyed it. This is going to be the first part of my series on race. We're going to do race-related topics uh, this month for Black History Month. In future episodes, I'm going to dig in just a little bit more, and in some of them, I'll even offer some of my own thoughts. And you know, maybe they might even be a little bit challenging and you know, uncomfortable for people, but it's okay because we're going to go there. We're going to have a conversation. Wow. We're going to try to listen to each other. But for right wow. now, let's go ahead and get into a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Yeah. All right, we're back. The goal of the Bill Review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, any order, any mandate. Now, neither Josh or I are lawyers, so this is not any legal interpretation. We're just simply reading the bill as is, as regular everyday Americans, and then going to do our best to interpret it based on our understanding of words in the English language. The cool thing about bills, it's not really that cool, is that bills range from a page or two up to thousands and thousands of pages long. The thousands and thousands of pages long, we probably aren't going to read those, but don't worry, we'll be able to learn something from them anyway, because this segment is going to be short. It's not meant to be very long. Why? Because bills can be kind of dry. They're kind of boring. So we're going to kind of keep it kind of short, okay? And in observance of Black History Month, we are going to focus on bills that are related to the Black community. President Biden recently signed quite a few executive orders. I believe 42 is the number. And at least two of them are related directly to the Black community. Today, we're going to talk about Executive Order 13995, which is titled Ensuring an Equitable Pandemic Response and Recover. It's only four pages long. We'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, that'll be up on Facebook. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, not on Facebook, but I mean on YouTube once this show airs on YouTube. And then you'll also be able to find them at libertydad.com. So before we get into it and we start talking, let me just kind of point out that there are four major sections of this particular bill. There's the purpose. There's COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, and then there's Ensuring an Equitable Pandemic Response, and then lastly, General Provisions. So the purpose is the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and exacerbated severe and pervasive health and social inequities in America. For instance, people of color experience systemic and structural racism in many facets of our society and are more likely to become sick and die from COVID-19. The lack of complete data disaggregated by race and ethnicity on COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates, as well as underlying health and social vulnerabilities, has further hampered efforts to ensure an equitable pandemic response. Josh, you are in the medical community. Yeah. Give me your thoughts on that. I want to hear them because I'm not. Uh, well... It, it's hard. The, 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 the entire, the, the very beginning, ensuring an equi equitable pandemic response and recovery. Well, it doesn't define what any of these metrics are. You know, what, what, what are we, what are we actually trying to achieve? And that we keep going back to that. And it, it acknowledges in, in the order, it acknowledges uh, systemic racism and how that's contributed to a uh, uneven distribution of healthcare in this country. But that sounds like, like a, on you know uh, what's a hot take on it uh, or a um, platitude I would suppose because they don't define what systemic racism is. Gotcha. You know, and, and so you have this uh, just title of something out there that you're going to allocate this task force to work on, and you're going to supposedly collect data on these minority groups for for metrics you didn't even lay out. Um, you know I, I really don't like open ended um, intrusions into the medical industry you know, 
whenever you're given free reign to do something, but you, you don't have any defined parameters, endpoints, and you don't even know about privacy. Uh, you know, there, there's so many concerns with this executive order. Um, and you're talking about the equitable distribution. Look, I really don't like the conflating of equality and equity of, of how it's being used. And, uh, you know, to this, you see uh, that they're, they're, this is manifesting in a lot of different uh, minority communities, even up into uh, prisons where they're like reallocating away from senior citizens to inject senior popula or, uh, prison populations. And it, with minorities, they're like, okay, let's, um, uh, let's take this into disenfranchised communities first. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure what this executive order really is going to achieve um, other than, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> back in. No, no. And I, and I think that's important because again, you know, Josh had said uh, that, you know, ah. you know, he's in the uh, medical establish he's in the medical community and he read the, this order and he's like, you know, I'm not really sure what it's supposed to accomplish. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't accomplish anything, but the question is what does it accomplish exactly? Now we want to point out that this, Ta it creates a task force, right? And the biggest sections of this are focused on membership, its mission, and data collection. And I think a fair summary of those three sections, and tell me if I'm wrong, Josh, maybe, I, maybe I've misunderstood this, right? But I think a fair summary is this, that the task force will be composed of heads of various government agencies, and their job is to review how the current pandemic resources are distributed within state, local, and other U.S. territories. Then they're going to identify where data collection might fall short and may even get in the way of distributing, uh, distributing these resources. And then finally, they're going to offer recommendations and submit reports to ensure pandemic resources are distributed equally. So did I get that about right? That, that's, that's pretty much what it says. Um, but the problem is, is that doesn't say much at all. Right. Um, you, you know, so you get all these these heads of these different agencies that are, that are, um, you know, tied into our medical, uh, complex, let's just call our medical machine. Right. Um, let, let's just say that each, every, each one of those individual agencies likes their sovereignty. Right. Um, so I, those, t those task force meetings, whether it be in zoom or in person, I'm sure are going to be quite interesting. Um, you know, but anyways, what they're doing is, they're collecting, they created this task force and in their combined efforts, all of them, they really, there's not really any aspect about uh, our healthcare system. They couldn't reach out to or collect data. Right. So I'm saying that they want to bridge the gaps of data collection. Um, I want to know why, like what, right. What is it you're trying to achieve and what is it you're trying to do now? Basically we're, we're creating a centralized um, portal for all healthcare. It's, it's, this could be pretty massive. Oh you yeah. Could, could be creating a centralized healthcare database that's government ran and operated. Oh, absolutely. Because they've have, been, because by the, by the way, this task force has the uh, ability to circumvent HIPAA. HIPAA doesn't apply to this. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so we talk about like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. And I think what was it? The, the limit was two years it created. This yeah. Order. So what happens is the way that this, uh, that this task force is to operate is they're going to exist until 30 days after accomplishing their mission or two years from the date of the order, whichever one comes first. However, the president has the option of extending it, of course. So it could be extended for much, much longer. And I think that's kind of the, the kicker is that this task force could exist for up to two years. And yet the purpose of it is to help ensure an equitable pandemic response. Well, think about that. Two years it might take, like, at, 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 you know, at its, and, and I don't want to say at its worst because its worst could be longer, but let's just say that it, let's say it only took one year. One year before they have figured out how to ensure an equitable distribution of resources. Well, I think that's I think that's a huge problem. But it's it's more than just a huge problem in the sense that hey, it could it could potentially take it though. Because remember, they're not actually doing anything. They're offering reports. 
they're offering um, suggestions. They're going to say, hey, this is where data collection falls short. This is where we don't know. And that's part of the problem because if we want to summarize it into like a single sentence, the task force is a fact finding group. That's all it is. Yeah. You know, like you were saying, Josh, you don't know what this does because nothing that it does impacts anybody directly. You know, nobody's going to be able to look at it in six months and say, oh, yeah, I'm glad they did that because of because that I now have this or that. Like, it's not going to be so readily identifiable. I, I actually imagine you you will hear that because it, it'll be the, it'll be credited for something that um, was picked up by another agency. See, there's already other medical groups uh, that, that are looking at like how the, specifically the vaccine, how it's getting distributed, what communities are getting it. We know who's got the vaccine. You know, we have the statistics, we have the data, uh, we know the ethnicities and, and, and age groups and it, you name it, that data is readily available. Gotcha. Um, so whenever you start a task force like that with no defined objective, uh, which I, I would probably be more upset about it initially, it, creating an executive order with an open-ended objective that really at its very face, like the only thing I could tell you for sure that this will do will be centralize everybody's medical data. So right, right off the bat, since you don't have any other objective, I'm definitely against this executive order because I don't see any purpose. Um, I don't see any, any you know, manageable purpose. Now, some of the other agencies, I know the CDC, one of the few things they've done pretty well is they have looked at the distribution in, into uh, minority and disenfranchised communities. And when saying that, we're talking mostly, this is, has to do with wealth than race in most cases of how they looking at it. Cause unfortunately it also synonymously, you know, there's more uh, people of color and minorities that are in, in the uh, in, impoverished uh, lines, but those are the people who lack that access to healthcare and, uh, you know, to the vaccines and everything. So I know that they've been working at setting up a lot of different sites. That's why they were actually initially looking at bringing FEMA in to, to administer vaccines. Cause they were trying to bridge that gap to people who, who were indigent, didn't have access to care. So beyond the things that's already taking place, like you said, I see it as a fact-finding mission, which might be okay. And the fact that it doesn't initially cost anything because it's included in that other budget, uh, like you had mentioned, um, you know, a lot of people aren't going to make a stink about it, but it does create a centralized database that all these uh, agencies now can interconnect. And you have to think about it. You mentioned task forces. You're starting to see this a lot with all these federal agencies. You've seen it with terrorism, where all of a sudden they, they joined it underneath a federal umbrella and called a task force. And all these uh, subsidiary agencies that didn't have as much authority as they do uh, were granted it because of the task force. So I see this as an, an expansion of power and a, uh, a centralized database with no objective. Right. And, you know, the other thing that I think is kind of insidious about this is that um, they're not really starting with facts, but kind of a hunch. They're kind of making a presumption. And it uses what I consider to be kind of clever language to make it seem like they've actually identified a specific problem when they really have it. And if you think about it, go back to the original, you know, when I when I read it earlier, I said, for instance, this is a direct quote. All right now, bud. For instance, people of color experience systemic and structural structural racism in many facets of our society and are more likely to become sick and die from COVID-19. That's a direct quote. So here's the thing, that and in there, when they say, um, you know, they're experiencing, you know, people of color are experiencing structural racism um, in many facets of our society and are more likely to become sick and die of COVID-19, that and does not combine two independent ideas. Right. It, it doesn't really connect them. It just well, it, it just puts them side by side and yeah. it makes one claim here. And then the other comment next to it kind of is uh, suggest that it follows from. But they're not really making a connection there. It doesn't imply uh, causality. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, I'll sit here and I'll tell you, undoubtedly, COVID, uh, the coronavirus uh, impacts African-Americans worse than it does Caucasians. Uh, Asians or Hispanics. And that doesn't have anything to do with wealth disparity. It has to do with how the virus actually binds in the body. Uh, it, potentially it's the, it's in the kidneys, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and uh, 
anyhow, leave the technicals aside, there is proven medical reasons why, you know, certain ethnicities are more prone to certain infections than others. We know this. So right off the bat, they can use a, a little bit of truth. Um, and then you add in a word like systemic racism and you try to bring validity to this task force. It's a, I see it as a clever play on words uh, at best. At worst, I see it as a way for them to say, look, we actually are addressing systemic racism. Never mind that they never defined it. And this task force can just sit out there and spin indefinitely. And we can always go back and refer saying, hey, we got this task force that's doing something about this systemic racism that we don't right. want to actually identify. Absolutely. And, you know, here's the thing for anybody that's watching and you might be saying, hey, you know, what? I don't think I like the tone of where you're going with this. All you know, what we're not saying, we're not saying that there's no such thing as any kind of racism. We're not saying that the issue doesn't affect the, uh, the black community more than it does the white community, nor are we saying that there's a connection between the two, right? What we're not saying at all. What I'm saying here is just by reading this bill, this four page bill that I have here, uh, or executive order, it's not really a bill, but this four page executive order, when you read it, you realize that they're taking some things, kind of like taking things that we get, you know, we can get honestly emotional about and say, hey, look, I don't like this idea of racism. And then they're saying they're using that as a springboard to say, well, let us do this. And the problem that I have with that is they're not telling us what exactly we are going to get out of it. And, and it's right here in the bill. So I'm not making it up. L listen, yeah. the lack of complete data disaggregated by race and ethnicity on COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates, as well as underlying health and social vulnerabilities has further hampered efforts to ensure an equitable pandemic response. That's direct quote from this executive order. Obvious question is, well, if there's a lack of complete data separated by race and ethnicity on health issues, then how do we know there's a lack of equity? How can you say there's a lack of equity when you don't have information? You know, um, and I think I think that's the problem that I'm pointing out here. I'm not pointing out that uh, everything that they're claiming is is inaccurate. What I'm pointing out is they're not presenting evidence to support it, and that's a problem when we're talking about government because government is using our tax money. They might implement legislation based on certain things. That legislation comes with a level of force or threat of force. And when we go that far, you know, if you're the type of person that says, hey, you know, some laws are good laws. If you're that kind of person, and many people are, the first thing that you should be concerned about is that we have absolute rock solid evidence to support everything that we're doing because we could end up you know, harming somebody else from what was ultimately just a guess. And I think that's the problem with this. That's one. And, you know, and I want to touch in, obviously, you know, neither one of us are saying that racism or systemic racism doesn't exist. If anybody listens to us, obviously we, we believe that, but. Um, right, right. Absolutely. You know, to me, I think it, this is a perfect executive order to have on the end of listening to Dr. King, because once again, this is just another, we're kind of listening to you, uh, you know, and it just kicks the right. can further down the road. That's the problem. We're not, we're not actually address, addressing what we need to address. And it's just more of the same. Right. And, and the thing is, when we're reading bills, when, well, when you're interacting with anybody, period, really, but specifically when we're reading bills, you cannot allow a claim to be made without good, solid evidence to back it up even if the claim is intended to produce a good result. And I might even say, I might even go further and say, especially if it's intended to produce a good result, because you can't get that good result if the evidence isn't really supported by fact. Now, maybe it is. It's, I'm going to leave it open and say, because I don't know, I'm going to leave it open and say, it might be possible that there is a lack of uh, equal distribution, right? I don't know. So far, it seems like it's not really the case because people can go and get vaccines on their own. And I'm not aware of anybody that's being turned down. This isn't the same as like, say, you know, we talked about earlier with the voter registration. Yeah. It's not quite the same where we say, okay, 
this group of people is allowed to vote after they take a test, right? We're not actively denying people a vaccine by saying, okay, well, everybody can have a vaccine if you pass this test and we know that a certain group of people won't do so well. We're not, that's not happening. You know, so, so in order to say that there's systemic racism, we really need to say where and what it is. You can't really claim that it, it exists and that it's impacting this particular area without saying this is, um, this is the evidence that I have to support it. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. It has to be objective, unbiased evidence that anybody from any background can look at the, the data themselves and come to a similar conclusion. And right. to me, that's what, that's what transparency- It's gotta be testable. Yeah, it has to be testable. Um, you know, especially policies. I, I, I'm not one to advocate for policies on subjective basis. So, um, yeah. Right, and, and I don't, I've said this before. Libertarians, Josh and I are both libertarians. Wow. You're gonna be hard pressed to find a piece of legislation that libertarians like. It's very, very infrequent, right? Generally, that legislation is undoing another one when we find one that we like. It's like, yeah. hey, you know, this piece of legislation now says that um, prohibiting alcohol is no longer uh, no, no, no longer permitted. OK, well, great. We will support that one, you know, but we didn't support the one that made it illegal in the first place. So, um, you know, but if you're going to come to me and you're going to say, look, I want you to. Uh, pass this piece of legislation. I want you to adhere to this executive order, whatever the case may be. I believe that we really need to have a very high bar for evidence before we're willing to accept it. And here's, here, we're getting into one of the reasons why, right? So here's another excerpt from the, uh, fr from this, from this executive order. Health and human services shall provide funding and administrative support for the task force to the extent permitted by law. Hello and with existing appropriations, Mommy. existing Mommy. appropriations. Now, at Mommy. first that sounds great. Mommy. Look, even Zach, even, you know, baby, you know, uh, baby Zach, baby Liberty, uh, Liberty son, I'm getting tongue tied here. Even Liberty's son is like, whoa, what? <coughs> well, what we're, if I could just interject there for just- Absolutely, go ahead, dig right. in. So you, you mentioned the HHS, um, look, what is being when you work with this system and you and, and like i do as a semi pharmacist uh, hence the apothecary name um you see what these different organizations do and what functions they take over um we truly are like they're building the roads right now for a um a federal centrally ran healthcare entity is what they're doing the hhs has basically taken over state boards of pharmacies and state boards of medicine during this pandemic um, now here in Florida, they, they, they've done it with pharmacists where they opened up, uh, the different people you can vaccinate, which by the way, it's still not legal in state law, but the HHS director wrote an executive order and made it legal for pharmacists to do all this stuff, which I, I'm not debating the merits of it, but the executive and the, uh, functions from these local boards of pharmacy and state boards of medicine have been taken by the HHS. So that's what we're that's what we're seeing ha happen here. We're seeing a consolidation of state powers be moved centrally, and and I I believe probably ultimately that's what that task force purpose is, is to do. But uh, the HHS, uh, sorry, I, I know that's a little tangential there, but that was tucked in there, and um, th that's going to be expanded quite a bit. Just just wait and see. I mean, I feel like most things get expanded, and I think what we've got here. It's something that sounds kind of good because at first it sounds like, hey, we're not going to use any additional funding. But remember, the task force can be operate up to two years or longer, and it's using money that's been already appropriated. Well, I imagine what they'll do is obviously like the task force will be a springboard to other probably pieces of legislation that they'll try to push through or something. Uh, but they'll, they'll just the next budget that comes up, they'll just jack the budget up to cover any shortfall for it. It's what they'll do. You know, that's how it's how a lot of these executive orders go through, because he, he doesn't really have a lot of autonomy with uh, finances, if I'm understanding right. You can't spend money from the executive branch than a certain amount. But that's correct. If you, if you tuck something in an executive order underneath one agency, it actually provide uh, gives that agency a, um, uh, they're running negative. So they need money now. Right. So it, it gives a, a, a valid reason for 
senators and congressmen to say, hey, look, you know, this this agency doesn't have enough money, which was by design so they could seek more. That's how they keep getting bigger. Uh, that's why, like, the task force will probably be called something else in two years, but it'll exist. Right. And and I think people, the way that people can visualize this is you're at your job and your boss's boss, not your boss, but your boss's yeah. boss comes out and says, all right, look, this team here, this group of people, I am tasking them with doing this new responsibility. And there's no money that's going to be, there's going to be no additional money involved. And so now there's more responsibility, there's more work, no additional, no, no additional money. And when you have no additional money, that means you're going to have to be diligent. You know, maybe you can hire somebody with the budget that you have, depending on what kind of a budget that you're working with, it might be possible. But in many cases, you wouldn't be able to hire somebody. So you're going to be doing uh, the things that are requested of you with the same staff, including, including the existing responsibilities. And like you were saying a moment ago, and I think this is where, you know, reading these bills and understanding and having a high level of a high bar for evidence becomes very, very important because what's going to happen? You're right. The president can't just say, all right, we're going to give more money to the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. We can't do that. He can't do that. But he can say, I want you to do these additional responsibilities. All right, buddy. He can, he can say that. And then later, Health and Human Services can go to Congress and they can say, you know, we really need to expand this budget because, you know, we just don't have enough money. And they'll so, have evidence and they'll have evidence right, support the group. Right. And so imagine at your own job, yeah. you know, now it doesn't quite happen that way because, you know, co companies don't just tax people and get more money. But imagine you would have the same conversation in your job. You would go to your boss and say, we need another person. Or you might say, look, if I'm going to have to do all this additional work, I want more money. You know, yeah. I, I was doing all that work for, you know, $15 an hour, my minimum wage. And now you're asking me to do more. Well, I should get $18 an hour. And then they might say, well, we don't have it in our budget. And you might say, well, you better go get a bigger budget. Right yeah. now, it doesn't quite happen that way because corporations do have a limit because they can only deal with the money that they have coming in. Government, however, they can say, well, we'll just tax people more. And they do, they tax people or, more. Or, or, or just print more money. I mean, right, or they print whatever. more money, you know. Um, but I mean, think about it. If you're listening in, I want you to ask yourself, when was the last time you heard of a government program that said, well, we had all these responsibilities and we were doing them and we were producing a whole lot of good stuff, but it turns out, you know, we just weren't able to get any additional money. So we're going to have to cut these or they come out and say, you know, we're going to cut this department over here because it's really important that we do uh, things over in this department and we need the funding. Like it doesn't happen that way. Right. People squawk when you talk about cutting funding or cutting departments. Yeah. Uh, that that can lead to a, that, that's a whole other topic. There Absolutely, yeah, it definitely is. So, but in wrapping this up, I'm going to give my final words. Give Josh a moment to say his final words. Okay, now, but Zach's trying to give yeah, his final words, to, right? Yeah, he's got. I know say he's got. He's, yeah, he's got a voice too, right? You know, Liberty right. Sun's got a lot of things to say here. So, what I want you to do is, I want you to remember this bill review. The next time you hear that the government needs to raise taxes, I want you to think about it and say, okay, why is it that you need to raise taxes? Is it because you put more workload on people before you actually had the budget? And then, what was that workload? Did that was that workload something that was going to be a little bit more valuable? Um, was it going to provide me a benefit? Or are you creating TPS reports? that nobody wants to do. Josh, last words. Um, first, uh, thanks for having me on. I hope to get better at this and kind of stay on point a little bit because, you know, this whole thing is new to me. So um, it's all good. I, I do appreciate that. Um, you know, sometime we, I think we should talk about finances and how, how we look at this because finances and government's like an onion problem. And I mentioned that a lot because a lot of our libertarian solutions are three or four layers deep. And we don't usually get that far in conversation with people. But you mentioned like, why, why does the government need more money for that? And then they can show that they've got, you know, proof of need like the HHS undoubtedly will do. But then was this a function they should have been doing to begin with? Was this a constitution? Right. Uh, yeah. You know, so and we get down and I always end up in property taxes on this. Well, why does, why is that money needed? Why is this a necessity? We, we've got this backwards where, we don't ask the government to prove something's necessity. You know, it's just kind of like, all right, you just add on and, you know, your taxes more, print more money. 
and um obviously that leads to bigger problems he's like show's over <laughs> right right he's like hey can we turn the light off yo because i'm done you know you're done uh, i'm it, done you're done is what he's saying i think no it was a good episode you know i'll i'll finish with this you you said a, a quote earlier and it's kind of made me think of one that uh, i always liked by dr stephen covey he wrote a book uh seven habits of highly effective people have you ever read that book you ever heard of it? Or? I've heard of it, and I think I've read some excerpts. I don't think I've read it. Yeah, you know, look, book's old. It's like thirty years old or so. But uh, I always try to revisit from time to time. But one of the one of the major habits is first seek to understand, then only to be understood. Right. And I have to remind myself that all the time because you know I, I'm very opinionated. Oh yeah. I'm passionate, I'm passionate about this stuff. Um, if obviously that comes with a layer of conviction in my beliefs, that's pretty yeah. hard. Uh, and sometimes that can come across as being um, like, I'm not willing to listen. Right. I'm like, I'm not willing. And I think libertarians, uh, I, I think I'm not saying everybody else is better at it than this, but we do a great job of not listening to each other. And uh, even with their own party, I'd like to right. like to see a little bit more listening. Like, what are we actually trying to achieve? Right. And yeah, I think absolutely. If, we, if we could focus on that, whether if it's politics, whether if it's personal relationships or whether if it's racism, <laughs> If we get back to honest conversations, honest conversations with one another, we'll be much better off. Absolutely. I think so. You're, you're 100% correct. And with that, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you got something out of it. Check us out again. We are in the middle of making a transition on our network, but you'll definitely be able to find me. Go to libertydad.com. You can also find me over at Liberty Dad. And it's, again, it's all one word, Liberty Dad on Facebook. And then you can also find me on Liberty Dad, at Liberty Dad Pod, P-O-D, on Twitter. And then Josh, where can people find you? Um, once again, we're, we're both on that same free speech media network. You know, uh, we're in a transition on that. Uh, currently, uh, you can find me on uh, YouTube under just my, Josh Fields, FarmD, uh, and also on Facebook, uh, The Libertarian Apothecary. And, uh, but there'll be more changes coming in the future, and I'm excited about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know what? If you thought, man, this show is a little bit rough, don't you worry, because we are going to nail this down, and we're going to get it smooth running. I've got some great ideas coming up in the future. And with that said, have a great week. Catch you next time, and we are out. <laughs>